Thank you for that introduction. Appreciate everybody coming here to hear me talk about Fusion and the Valley Space team for inviting me. So first of all, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on Fusion to start off the talk so we're on the same page. So what is common all Fusion Systems? We're a private company that was spun out of MIT just over four and a half years ago. Uh, we're focusing on leveraging a new superconducting magnet technology, which I'll tell you about, than a very conventional fusion pathway. And we've recently, uh, just over a year ago, de demonstrated this, our successful magnet technologies, thus unlocking this new pathway for fusion. With that, we've raised over $2 billion in uh, private investment into our company that's enabling us to actually go forward and build this fusion reactor. And our team is growing to over 600 people by mid next year. And we are the only uh, private fusion company that's actually building, in the process of building something to demonstrate net energy from fusion. The only other entity in the world is actually all of the, basically all the world's developed governments together in a project that's about 20, 25 times more expensive than what we're doing. And uh, we really believe that we are the best chance for scaling fusion energy. And so with this, the world really needs a new energy technology. We have a bunch of different ways of generating electricity but most of them have external externalities that are negative to people. Uh, most importantly are uh, fossil fuel burning ones that release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we really believe that to stop doing that, we need one of the largest uh, technology transitions that humanity has ever faced. And so this wedge represents essentially what you have to do to decarbonize the electricity industry by 2050. And so what, what is fusion energy? Well, it's the thing that powers the stars. So fusion is combining light molecules uh, into heavier mo molecules, and then by this little Einstein magic, they end up releasing an incredible amount of energy. Actually, compared to burning things chemically, it's about 200 million times more energy per unit mass. So that means that effectively on any sort of human energy time scale, so the fuel is limitless in what we're doing. And so why, why is fusion so disruptive? Well, first of all, zero emissions. You saw that process back on the previous slide. The only thing that comes out of this is helium, which is the, the, essentially the most safe and chemically inert element there is. The process is inherently safe, so contrast with fission. There's no chance of meltdown, there's no long-lived nuclear waste, and there's really no uh, weapons proliferation risk based off of it. It's also a very scalable technology. You're basically building it on the same scale as today's coal power plants, fission power plants, uh, and it looks very normal to the grid in those senses, unlike many of the challenges of modern renewables. Uh, the fuel supply is essentially inexhaustible on human scales, and we're really leveraging the existing infrastructure. And from what we tell and what other, other people in the industry are able to uh, calculate, we believe that it will be economically competitive. And so how do you actually do fusion? Here's a little cartoon that a, a fusion scientist drew when he was trying to compile all the different ways of doing fusion. And so you can think of it as basically two different ways that you hold on to this. You're literally holding on to something that's hotter than the sun. And what, on the left and on the bottom, you have magnetic confinement systems. So basically, magnetic fields are an incredibly good insulator when you're holding onto these fusion plasmas. And then on the right, you have what's called inertial confinement fusion. And so that's where you're taking a little bit of fusion fuel and you're compressing it very quickly from the outside. And so then on the graph on the right, that's uh, showing what has been demonstrated in many of these different types of fusion experiments. So the bottom axis is the ion temperature, and the vertical axis is the density, and then a, what we call the confinement time, which is just basically how well you're insulating it. And so, for some, and then, wait, uh, upper right-hand corner is also the plot of Q, basically the energy gain in the system. So you have to get to really incredible temperatures and densities. And for a very simplistic analogy, the experiments that are living in the bottom left-hand corner, that's just basically uh, the equivalent of a paper airplane or maybe a kite. And then the things that are up in the, Upper right hand corner are like commercial airliners. And so many of them have been tried, but they're, they're so far away in physics that you can't actually believe that they'll scale to a power plant. But the one concept that has been tried really well and successful is the tokamak. You see it's the only one that's in the upper right hand corner there. And the two experiments today that are being built to demonstrate net energy, you see eater and spark there. And so to look at how that has progressed over time, now we just combine, multiply those two axes together and we see that over time, this tokamak concept for doing fusion has increased uh, exponentially in how well it's performed. This has actually outpaced Moore's law, what it was doing. And this is really due to the coupled uh, evolution of, of science and technology working hand in hand to make a better understanding. 
And, but you see that the, the progress essentially stagnated in the mid-1990s, and you ask, what, what happened there? Did you hit like a sound barrier that you weren't able to bust through? And it was really due to technology limitations that you'll see in another slide. And so that dragged out the timeline for conventional tokamax eater out there. But with what we're doing, we have a new technology we believe is breaking that stagnation, allowing us to get above break-even parameters. And you probably have heard, if you heard about Fusion, you've heard about some other private Fusion companies. I plot their performance down there. And you can see that they have a very long way to go. And there's at such lo low performance parameters, it's even a question whether it's physically possible to make an energy system out of it. So with this, you have to ask, okay, so Fusion, it's always, it's been tried for many decades. What is, what is this new technology that's breaking through this stagnation? And so it's this thing called a HTS, which is short for high temperature superconductors. So over here we have a, a graph of uh, a surface of how a superconductor performs. So basically it's able to carry a certain amount of current, which you need to make your electromagnets, and then it has that performance based on the temperature and the magnetic field that it's actually in. And you see the orange surface in there is the old technology, so-called low temperature superconductors. It was very low on the temperature axis because you need liquid helium to have it perform. And then in the late 1980s, a new uh, form of superconductor, they titled high temperature superconductors, but still only up to almost 100 Kelvin or liquid nitrogen temperatures. That's still relatively cold to most, what most people deal with. And so because it was able to get up to these higher temperatures, they actually won a Nobel Prize for it. But for us as magnet engineers, we really care about the magnetic field axis because you can see the low temperature superconductor technology is really limited to very low magnetic fields, so you're only able to build relatively weak magnets. Now, essentially, for our purposes, it's unlimited in the magnetic fields that we can do with it. So then what do we do as superconducting magnet engineers is we take this superconducting material that we can now buy from suppliers. It actually took over two decades of very careful material science to turn it in for, from a laboratory curiosity to an actual engineering material. And then what we do is first engineer it into what we call superconducting cables. So it's a very useful engineering unit that they in integrate into a superconducting magnet system. And so with that, so there's been over 170 tokamaks built and studied to date. And with that, we're able to actually predict what are, how are they going to perform with very high accuracy. And the two major levers for how well they perform in fusion gain are the bottom axis, the strength of the magnetic field, and then the vertical axis, the size of them. So basically that, how well it's able to insulate the plasma. And you can see there's a trade-off. You can either go higher in one or higher in the other or a little higher into both. And so with the old magnet technology, you're really limited to this very low space and magnetic field. And so you see the little orange line for where the power plants can live. If you're limited at low magnetic field, that means it had to be very big. So it's no surprise that ITER was such a big machine. That was the, what the engineering and the physics dictated it had to be at the time. But the problem is that we are not just going to demonstrate the energy. We don't want fusion to be economically competitive. Otherwise, it doesn't matter in the marketplace. And those machines would are extraordinarily expensive, so we need to go to smaller size. And so that's what this new magnetic technology does. It essentially opens up this whole entire window of space where we can now operate and we can build machines that are much smaller in size. So we're now no longer limited by magnetic technology, we're actually limited by fundamental nuclear physics of having to shield the magnets. And so this opens up a whole tier new pathway where you're able to do fusion at a much smaller scale and iterate at a much faster speed. And so with this, this is what our overall uh, technology roadmap looks like. So we start off, we completed Alcator CMOD. That was the machine I had the honor of doing my PhD on at MIT. It was a really incredible high perform machine. And then last year we did the superconducting magnets. We're underway on construction with the Spark device, which is its goal is to demonstrate net energy from fusion for the first time. And then we've already begun designing the ARC device, which is aiming to demonstrate electricity onto the grid from fusion energy. And so all throughout this, the, back to the theme of the talk, is concurrent R&D and design in parallel. So we started designing the Spark device right as we started doing the R&D for the magnet. Just like even before we're getting the results from Spark, we're starting on the design of ARC to really shorten the timelines to what we're doing. And to contrast this, so on the top is the government plan. I wish I had the United States fusion government plan, but the United States government doesn't actually even have a plan to get to fusion energy yet. So I put up the European one, where uh, present day we have JET Tokamak, which is one of the highest performing in the world, uh, and then ITER, which is aiming to do net energy from fusion uh, right now in the late 2030s, 
and then from that, they want to go on and build demo. And so why is it getting big, big, bigger? It's quite frankly just because of the risk tolerance that this type of organization has in its serial development. They only want to use proven technology, so that's really pushing them to a corner where just you take that to a person that uh, runs power plants and say, nope, that's going to be too expensive. And so with what we're doing, because we're willing to take innovation as, as only as the biggest levers, that allows us to go ahead and do these new types of things and do them at a much smaller scale and hopefully get to it at a time scale where you make a practical impact. And so what, what do these two uh, different processes look like? So in serial development, basically very clear stage gates and, process and uh, phases of development. So you do your R&D, once the R&D is successful, then you can go start the design. Once the design is complete, then you can go start the construction. And so this is, has some pros to it. It minimizes the chances of rework, basically you're confident in the answer. It also is easier to plan and manage what's going on when you know the answers. And then the process also enables what I consider maybe lower performing or average performing teams to succeed on a project. But it's really, what you're doing is you're committing to a very long path along the way. And as opposed to that, there's a parallel development path. So you see my little arrows and circles there, that's kind of like the, similar to the spiral development path that's been talked a few times today. And the pro of this is it really gives you the best chance of delivering something at a reduced timeline. The cons are, as I'll talk about a little bit later, it's harder to manage and as changes are needed along the way, it's, you've got to be able to flexible to that. It also requires an organization and people with the right mindsets and able to succeed. And both, both of these types of paths do actually have the right cases as for the right organizations with the right types of risk tolerances. And so a quick example of what a serial development path looks like. This is the United States Department of Energy, what they call their critical decision process. And so anybody that's worked with that, you kind of get a little, little shudders on your back of your neck because it's all so slow and complicated. And so I've given you uh, just a subset of the stage gates to get through each of these. And so you see things like uh, preconceptual plans, design reviews completed, management plans, and you have to get through all of these uh, hoops to get to the next stage gate to get your next check for the Department of Energy. And to contrast that, this is a rough uh, overview of what we're actually doing at CFS. So the top two lines show what our R&D is doing, and the bottom few lines show what we call the device. That's a colloquial term that we use just for Spark or Tokamak. And you see that back in uh, late 2018, we were starting our basic magnet R&D. At the same time, we're actually starting our design of Spark, and I'll explain how that works a little bit later. And in parallel, right after that, we start doing our full magnet test. And you note that we're audacious enough to even start on our site construction before the magnet test was done, because that's what's needed to do to go fast. And I'll explain how we're trying to manage that by, with our team. And so this type of path, it still shares a lot of characteristics of the uh, more common uh, serial development path, like we've got mission planning, you gotta have schedules, budgets, resource loading, and design reviews, and all those things, because those are critical things along the way to make sure that you're doing things right and enable you to be successful. And let's see, and so with that, so when uh, was basically when I was talking to people at Valley Space, we came up with the idea for the talk, but I wasn't really sure what type of content I'd actually talk with you about. And so in sitting down thinking about it, I realized that the framework for me is that really to be successful, in, in hindsight at this at least, you need good people and good processes and the certain types of people and certain types of processes to be successful. So those are the issues that I'm gonna talk to you through, through the rest of the talk. And I came up with, uh, if anybody has ever dealt with a management consultant, they love uh, very simple two by two matrices and you always wanna be in the upper right hand corner of them. So of course, low performing people and bad processes just run away from that as quickly as you can. There's almost no chance of success there except for by just dumb luck. Uh, if you have a, lucky enough to have a high performing team but you put bad processes on it, that is a terrible place to work. I feel sorry, I've worked in that type of environment briefly and I don't wish that upon anyone else. That's how we call that organizational purgatory. And actually in the space of good processes, you can actually have good processes that enable teams that aren't the highest performing team to be successful in what they do. But then that type of good process on that type of team isn't the same type of process that's good for a high performing team. So I'm gonna to try to just focus on the things in the upper right hand corner because that's really what you need in this type of uh, parallel R&D and design organization. You need both very carefully chosen processes as well as very capable people along the way. 
And so first, uh, focusing on the people, I've subdivided crudely into the leadership of the organization, the management of the organization, the individual contributors, and I'll explore both uh, what their roles are in this type of organization as well as what types of characteristics make them successful. So first of all, the leadership. The leadership, really, they provide the holistic view of how everything fits together and why they can be done in parallel. So it's really needed for the offset. You need someone with the vision that says that, okay, I'm act we're actually gonna be able to do this. We can actually design this while we're doing the R&D, and we can be flexible enough while we're designing it to incorporate the R&D results later on in the design. And then another key part is ensuring that the stakeholders, in this case, investors and board members, because we're a privately funded company, buy into the pathway. Because you just take it to an old-fashioned software engineering VC person, the old eyes will glaze over and they'll say, that's too risky, I have no, no I, I'll just invest in the next laundry washing startup. And, but, uh, so there's, there are classes of um, venture capitalists that are actually very knowledgeable of this type of thing. They've seen it done in the past and they actually uh, go ask them for advice on how to do it because they've seen many ways that it has failed. And then the leadership is also very important in setting the tone and providing a safe environment because you will fail along the way. Um, it's guaranteed. It might be, if you're lucky, it's small failures. If you're unlucky, it's gonna be big failures. And you really need the leadership team to be setting the proper tone and making sure that the, the people in the company are able to handle those failures gracefully and then recover from them quickly. And then when things don't go as planned, they won't. Uh, basically, they're there to help rapidly refactor what the strategy is gonna be and put the organization back on a path to success. The next level, Management, these are the people that uh, provide the interface between the leadership and the people actually doing the work in day to day. They're the ones who get to set the direction of the individual contributors. And it's really important because they're the ones that end up creating the processes uh, that enable the work to be done in this type of environment. And for us, we were very fortunate. We're a group of plasma physicists. What, uh, like, what the heck do we know about running an organization? We're able to attract some very good talent out of some other companies where they've seen these types of things before and helped us in implement them. And these uh, management is also supposed to help coach the individuals the right process and right mindsets. Because oftentimes, a lot of the great talent you get, they're right out of school and they're not used to this type of thing. As far as my college experience went, it definitely did not premier, prepare me for this type of organization. And in addition to managing down, managing up is just as readily important. They have to be able to understand what the most important information is and get it up to the leadership level in a timely manner. Because the leadership, they can't be omnipotent, they can't be seeing and knowing everything that happens. And finally, they have to be flexible enough to adjust their plans as, as is dictated by what's going on. And lastly, for this part, individual contributors, uh, it's really important that they have flexibility in thinking and they're not attached to exactly what they're doing, and it's not their own little uh, baby of a design, they have to take care of it and nurture it. They have to be really flexible. And, okay, so I worked hard on this, but you know what, it didn't work out, so I have to go on and move on to the next thing. And the important thing is that we're making this a success. They have to be comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, they have to progress with the design despite not knowing the answer. That's one of the things that's really quite challenging for some people, is that, okay, I'm gonna, I have to make this work, but I don't know how, how it's gonna work and so they have to learn through that. And then also have to be agile to new information, because once you have the R&D results come in, you have to be able to implement those quite readily. And also basically resilient to failure. They're gonna have things go wrong and they have to be able to land on their feet and basically move forward and not uh, wallow. And so with that, from the people, now we go kind of right processes of the or parallel organization. Uh, these are the headings that I'm gonna cover in the next slide, so I'm not gonna read through them in detail here. So the first one is that you basically proceed at the design, uh, proceed at risk with the design, and you assume R&D success. This is the fundamental thing that you're doing when you're doing parallel R&D and design. If R&D goes well, everything's great. You're as far ahead of the curve as you can, but eh, there's always things that go wrong. And if things don't go well to a degree, the high-performing team will be able to recover quickly and still be ahead of the serial plan. And if R&D goes poorly, you might want to refresh your resume and start looking out. And so with this, uh, I'll, for each one of these, I'll give uh, kind of some color of the CFS successes that we had along the way. So the TFMC, that stands for the toroidal field model coil, is our R&D magnet. And you can see an image of it on the lower right there in its cryostat. And it went to full field on its first run. So we turned it all the way up to full performance on its first run. Now granted, 
Well, we're cooling it down for the first time. It, we have a liquid helium system that's operating at 20 atmospheres and 20 Kelvin. There are some leaks. We had to warm it back up, repair those leaks. Kind of standard for any, do, doing any sort of R&D cryogenic system. You don't know where the leaks are until you actually run it. And so this was just flat out amazing. This confirmed that our DC structural and electromagnetic uh, design was solid. That the same design that we're using for the Spark device was going to work in those parameters. And this means that the Spark magnets were largely uh, good to go and that we really didn't have to do any changes to the interfacing systems. The space we had resolved for them and the things that de depended on their performance was good to go. And you'll see uh, right at the end of this, there's a little, one, one or two things went wrong and we recovered from it, but those we mentioned later. And another step is you need tight linking between the design and R&D teams. Basically, you need both of those, you need that to make the parallelization a success. You have to make sure that the R&D is actually answering the key questions that you need for design and retires the right risks along the way. Otherwise, it's a fundamental question of why the heck are you doing it? And for this, it was really great to have the designers and analysts that are both doing the R&D object as well as the, the final design are hopefully the same people. That way, they have all the know-how and knowledge is directly transferred between the two of them. And of course, you have to have regular meetings to keep everyone updated. And so with the CFS success on this one, we had the same people for both, both teams. Um, they were sitting in both camps, almost completely for both teams. And so this meant that our structural, electromagnetic, thermal hydraulic analysts were all the same people and they're all running the same codes on both objects. And we had the same man magnet manufacturing engineers. We are going to manufacture our magnets for our next device and hopefully all of our fusion devices because that's really where our core IP is. And so this was not only a test of the system, it was building up our own internal manufacturing capabilities in a way that we thought would scale to the final device. And of course, then we also had the same test engineers working on both programs. Of course, weekly meetings with all of them. And the ongoing design of Spark on the little right there, every, every single week we'd make progress on that design. And the progress that up until essentially the last minute as we're having to release the drawings for the the test magnet, the progress that we're making in design was helping to inform what the test magnet should do. And with this, this is really setting up the R&D to maximize our learning, based both confirming the analysis techniques as well as the manufacturing techniques along the way. And the next part is keeping much as possible not dependent on R&D. So basically, this is, this is the one miracle rule, essentially. And we're only using this parallel R&D to leverage the biggest innovation for us. And the magnets were hands down the biggest innovation that we could do to demonstrate net energy. And so what this does is enables, uh, you're really trying to minimize the enabling R&D that you need for the other systems, the other miracles along the way. That points to using proven technology with good engineering practices and hopefully good suppliers that you can work with. And so what that looked like for us is that there's an experience basis of over 170 tokamaks that have been built to date. So we basically know how to engineer these types of systems. And for us, essentially, all of the non-superconducting magnet magnets relied very little on R&D, maybe a few prototypes along the way. And I'll admit it that a lot of this challenging, a lot of this engineering was super challenging along the way, pushing the boundaries of what you can do with different types of materials. But it still was relatively straightforward engineering activity and didn't require any other miracles or R&D risk results retired. And so with that, we also want to commit to tackling the important problems first and push everything else along as much as needed. And so this is really, we were a resource constrained organization. You know, you look at that and you laugh, okay, you raised 200 million and you raised 1.8 billion. It turns out you can burn through money pretty quickly doing these types of things. And uh, let's see, and so this points to spending only your resources needed onto pushing the critical path along as much as possible. And for, what that means is you focus on the design issues to inform what's needed for the R&D, and then do the R&D as quick as possible to get to your answers so you can move on with other work to progress. And so what that looked like for CFS on this was that our magnet R&D was again the major focus, and the other systems were pushed along in parallel as much as we could. Uh, so after the magnet R&D, the two other things in the critical path were one, just the buildings needed to house Spark, and two, the per some procurement of some long lead uh, items. And so that meant that we had to push all of our other system designs along just enough to answer the critical questions like, how big does the building have to be? About how much does this have to weigh so we have enough concrete? How many neutrons are gonna come off of it? Those types of things. How much cryogenic cooling we'll need? And so that, that meant that, uh, so, like I said a couple slides ago, that 
we actually started construction on the site before the R&D results were done. And so about the same month that the magnet test was successful, that's what the site looked like. So we already had the trees cleared, we already had the hole dug, and we're already pouring concrete for the machine before the R&D results were even in. And we're also, uh, for the procurement side of things, we're already read, ready to buy our cryo plant, but we've just needed the Series B funding to actually write the check for that. And so that will establish requirements are, and interfaces are critical. These are things that have been echoing out throughout the day. And the hard part is actually doing it, for sure. And so the interfaces are where the systems, and oftentimes teams, have agreed upon handoffs. And so it's really important that that, that, that is well-defined and also agreed upon values for it. And then the requirements are the basis of which the design is measured to. And so doing these well makes it really clear what the R&D needs to do. And it also makes it easier to recover once you have your R&D results in. And they might have gone a little bit off. If you have very clear requirements and interfaces, then you can make your updates quite simply. And so with CFS successes for here, where measurement requirements were established for the start, that's what we use to define what we're doing for R&D and directly inform the risks to retire, so that included things like the superconducting magnet performance, now we call it the critical current at the room temperature. Basically, the magnet was under the same stresses and strains, it was made out of the same materials and the same configurations, same cryogenic cooling, and the same manufacturing techniques. So we really were able to retire all sorts of big uncertainties with the system. And so for the wider spark design, the requirements and interfaces are enabled to proceed effectively. And in addition to that, you have to have a very good process for propagating changes. It, it's admittedly, it's very hard for teams to basically stick to, remember, and propagate what decisions that have. One of the things that's unfortunate is like, didn't we make that decision again? Who wrote that down? Where is that? Where's that type of information? And so it's really committing to those, and it needs to be managed well. And when something is baseline and change, it's very important that the stakeholders need to find out. If something's changed and the important stakeholder doesn't find out, that's uh, going to propagate on through the system. And so this organizations need to efficiently react to the R&D results. So for our successes, basically change control processes were established early. There were some growing pains as an organization as we actually learned how to do it because we're, we're not quite at the level of fission where you need very hard, clear controls and we're not quite at the point where we're like a startup rocket company where we can blow up one or two along the way. And so this really enabled the uh, learning from the R&D once we had the process in place to be incorporated effectively into the magnet design. And finally, when some things don't go as planned, you gotta focus on quickly and ruthlessly resolving it. So uh, this is the thing where, okay, things don't go as planned, so your ideal shortest schedule, it'll slip out just a little bit, but you have to try to make sure it doesn't slip out too much. And it's best to know ahead of time, who are your most agile thinkers on your team uh, because these are the people that when these things are under pressure, they're the ones that will actually rise to the occasion and help you solve your problems. And when, when things do go wrong, assemble them, give them clear guidance, dedicate resources to them, have, make sure they know that this is their focus and this is what they're doing, and then keep tight deadlines. And you'll be surprised at how well some people rise to the occasion for these types of things. And so for us, I'm gonna take a screen grab of probably my favorite scene from a movie as an engineer ever. Like this perfectly, uh, dictates the process for me. This is from Apollo 13, if anybody doesn't recognize it. And they needed to make an air filter from one fit into another. And they had only the things on, uh, up in space with the astronauts to be able to do it. And so this is, this is the thing as an engineer that gets, gets me excited and hopefully gets you excited too. And so for us, when we had our R&D magnet, although under DC conditions, it performed perfectly fine. We pushed it pur purposefully into an off normal thing. It broke. Uh, but in a way that it could have really been a moral destroyer for the team. Like they, they worked so hard on getting it and then it broke and it didn't survive this, this event. And so to the lower performing team, this could have crushed them. But fortunately, we, we had prepared the team in the right ways, gave them the freedom to fail in this type of way, and it ended up being an incredible learning event for us. In breaking it in this way, we learned more about the magnet than we did in all the kind of static test analysis. It, reconfirmed our models to better precision, actually made us innovate in new ways that made the magnet stronger. And so this is what's really, really exciting about having a high-performing team is when things like this happen, you see them rise to the occasion, you actually are better for it. So with that, we executed the uh, parallel R&D on the magnet and were able to proceed at, uh, with the spark design. Oh, delayed just a hair from it. And so we're starting off now on the arc design 
and starting up on the R&D on that. And we're actually starting to do that and we're preparing, thinking very carefully about, okay, we need some innovations from Spark, need some answers there. How do we end up incorporating an arc? And so that's what we're doing presently at CFS. And I'll leave you an image with the latest picture of this site. So in the upper right-hand corner, you see our magnet manufacturing facility, as well as our engineering offices, about seating for about 300 people there. And then down here in the center of it, you see the tokamak hull for Spark. So that's literally almost three meter thick concrete walls to keep the neutrons in place. And it's gonna be capped uh, shortly this month. And you see some of the building wings where we're gonna have our magnet power supplies, our RF power supplies, our diagnostics, and our cryogenic system. So I think fusion's finally just around the corner. So with that, thank you. Uh, are there any anybody that would like to go first here? Livingston, okay, I'm coming to you. The material for your um, superconducting magnets was not available when you started, but it became available over time. Is that something you had <clears throat> a material supplier build for you, or is that something you actually brought in house? That's a good question. So the fundamental enabling material, it's called REMCO, it's a rare earth barium copper oxide. So right when we kind of started it, it was basically about this time in 2017, we started, wait, 2015, we started looking at it seriously. At that point in time, there was a couple of suppliers that could make it at a performance that was relevant for us, but not in quantities at all relevant for us. So that was, that was just enough for us to believe that this was worth pursuing. And so with that, as we started gaining more traction, we started working with some suppliers. Some were better than others. And we were ramped up with the suppliers. As we got more funding, we found ones that were ended up being really good partners with us, willing to take risks as we were taking risks. And they were able to ramp up their capacity of the stuff at quality sufficient for us uh, along with us. And so it's something that we had to work together on. Mentioned there that you uh, about writing requirements, and I think early on in the day we did have somebody uh, ask or pose the question of what is it that makes a good requirement, and perhaps you can give some insights on this or the inverse. What can, what kind of things can we try to avoid? I suppose the the clearest sign that something is not a good requirement is you find that people are arguing about it. So that's the clear sign that you maybe you should take a step step back and try to figure out what, figure out wh why they're arguing and what they're arguing and how to reformulate it to prevent that. And it, it, is, it is an art in itself. It almost takes someone who is a good engineer, who has the, the logical characteristics of a lawyer, but also uh, like interpersonal characteristics to, under, to have a very good theory of mind of, okay, this is what other engineers will think about it, and here's how I can write this requirement in such a way that it's, it's very clear technically and no one will argue argue about it around it. So I suppose I don't, I don't have a magic prescription, but that's kind of some overview. And I think it's interesting. I mean, even though all the speakers here um, are developing complex things, I guess there's nothing as complex as, as, as uh, solving fusion, right? But it seems that the, the writing of requirements is something that's actually universal for all engineers. And yeah, it's a way that we communicate. It's a way that we communicate what we need to do for sure. I'd, I'd pose that uh, quantum computers are more complicated, but yeah. That big picture that we saw at the end. I'm just wondering what the power output is for that, and like what the cost is per kilowatt hour. Excellent question. This guy's got economics on his mind. That's important. And so for that, it's, it's a prototype experiment dem to just demonstrate net energy from fusion. And so what it'll be at full performance, it'll be about 140 megawatts of power coming out of it, but for only for 10 second pulses. This is part of us defining what our MVP, minimum viable product, was for it. And we decided that going out and talking to customers that basically, if you can get something hot, much like this room is the burning coal over there, all this other equipment, they know how to turn that hot thing in, into electricity. And then so for our next generation, we're actually aiming to demonstrate electricity from it. It's aiming to be about uh, between 500 and uh, 500 and 1,000 megawatts of thermal power in it. And then because it's first of a kind, it, it probably is at a marginally competitive uh, sense per kilowatt hour, but we think that with all the learning that you come from actually building and operating it, that it will be a very competitive uh, cost per energy. So over lunch, you told me that you have around um, one person per day that you're like onboarding on this team because you had to grow extremely fast. Um, 
what's your way of thinking of bringing people up to speed in this? And how do you make sure that the quality of engineering that you are setting, right? You said like it's the high performing teams that you want. How do you make sure that you don't dilute that because to reach these ambitious goals, you'll probably need all of these teams to perform in a similar way? Excellent question. So I'll answer the second one first. So ensuring the quality of the team. So what we're doing is we're making it very clear with everybody who's a hiring manager that it's much more important to get a quality person in than get a good, a good to okay person in sooner. So we're much more forgiving to our people to say that, okay, you, we all trust your judgment on who are good quality engineers because you're a good quality engineer and you're working with good quality engineers and we want you to make sure you set, keep that standard and it's okay if you slip on schedule to get in a good quality engineer in the short term because like, the, everybody knows how much effort and time it takes in to have someone who's mediocre. It's, worth, it's way better to just wait a little bit longer and get the good quality person in. And how we're onboarding and ramping it up, well, first of all, everybody that comes in, they have a buddy that's been there longer than them. I know it's, it's hard when maybe the average age of the company is maybe a couple months per person that they've been on there, but there are a sufficient number of experienced people who, who know the ropes, who know the basics. An addition challenge for us for ramping people up is that there's very few people there who are well-versed in fusion. There's many excellent engineers that can learn to be well-versed, and so what we do is we go ahead and we make sure we provide very good material that helps teach them and learn them in our technology so they can get up to speed on what we're doing. You just said that the superconductors were a blocker along the way. Um, what other blockers do you see going forward over the next, let's say, five years or so? Just demonstration net energy, there's no technology blockers along the way for us that we can foresee. It's just, it's now it's a case of uh, executing on a complex big project and doing it successfully on time and on budget. I'm saying that simply, but that, that in itself is a huge challenge. For the next generation of technology, we're aiming to de demonstrate electricity. There's some things around, okay, we want to use a molten salt for, because it has certain characteristics that are very good. There's plenty of R&D that we have to do along the way for that. There's some more R&D in our magnets that we want to do. We want to basically be able to take our electromagnets apart and put them back together again because that enables much be better maintenance of the machine. And then with that, so I'm confident that we're able to build something that can demonstrate net electricity from fusion. The hard part is keep uh, making it be economic. So basically, the fusion plasma in there is incredibly aggressive and really ruins the surface. And then also the neutrons coming out of the plasma are really, they're not kind to the materials and they beat them up and reduce their performance. Eventually, there's a lot of components on the inside that need to be replaced. So that'll really be the, my, my, as a chief technology officer, that's what I worry about for actually making fusion work, is being able to make those materials survive for long enough and then replace them quickly and efficiently enough such that it ends up being an economic energy source. Thank you.